welcome to our Digital Grid Summer Webinar Series. Um, in this first of our uh, summer series, uh, co-hosted by EPRI and Stanford, uh, we are going to be going through the lessons learned from the Digital Grid Virtual Workshop that we held uh, two weeks ago. And uh, my name is Omar Siddiqui. I'm a Senior Program Manager at EPRI. And I'm uh, joined as my co-host uh, by Liang Min, Managing Director of the Bits and Watts Initiative at Stanford University. Uh, it's our, our pleasure to host you. And I know people are uh, coming in as we are, are speaking. So, uh, you know, look forward to uh, having you all participate and uh, to learn uh, and get some perspective from the uh, really important uh, event that we held uh, two weeks ago. So let's just get right into it uh, uh, in respect to everyone's time. Uh, first of all, uh, this is a recorded webcast. Right now we have everyone that's a, uh, an attendee on mute. Uh, that's just to keep the noise down and make sure that we uh, keep things uh, going with the, as, as minimal disruption as possible. Uh, but this is interactive and we want your participation. I'd certainly recommend using the chat feature, which you can see in the toolbar at the bottom. If you uh, look there, as a great way to uh, select and type in your question. You can also select yourself as a panel, as an attendee and uh, raise your virtual hand to ask a question. Uh, but we will be monitoring uh, the Q&A chat session as we go forward. And again, this is being recorded, so your participation is your consent uh, to being recorded. And um, all of the presentations, this presentation today, as well as the recording, will be available and posted on both uh, EPRI and Stanford uh, websites, and we'll provide some more information on that. So thank you for your understanding. Uh, we are really excited to be hosting this summer webinar series, and the objective is just to uh, make sure that we're all uh, oriented. Uh, we are convening experts from across multiple disciplines uh, to present their visions and their perspectives on what a shared integrated digital grid uh, represents. And we heard uh, a lot about that on our uh, digital workshop event last week, and we will be getting some better perspective on it here today. And over the course of the, uh, this weekly summer, uh, summer webinar series, uh, we are going to be focusing on identifying the critical gaps towards uh, achieving this shared integrated grid uh, vision. Uh, principally, uh, the en enabling data platforms uh, to make it happen, and you see in the graphic on the right, the different elements that a shared integrated digital grid uh, entails. And, uh, you know, one of the key uh, underpinnings is a enabling data platform. So that's one of the uh, issues that will be thematically that will be explored, as well as understanding the utility industry requirements for having, uh, you know, for what a this, what such a digital or, or data platform would entail, and discussing the technology solutions to help bridge those gaps. Ultimately, we are looking for this uh, activity to help inform ongoing our, uh, activities around uh, advancing research, culminating in a collaborative research initiative uh, industry-wide that uh, we're looking to launch to make sure that we accelerate the development of, of these uh, enabling data platforms to enable the shared integrated grid vision. Uh, on our, uh, the first of our meetings uh, two weeks ago at the digital workshop, uh, uh, my colleague, uh, Vice President Mark McGranigan at EPRI, presented a, a vision of a shared integrated grid. And one of the things that I would say uh, to consider is the idea of when we speak of an integrated grid, uh, we are thinking not only in terms of uh, electric infrastructure, but also uh, the, uh, you know, in, interconnection of, the tele, of an enabling telecommunications infrastructure, the enablement of, of customer-centric local uh, energy networks. So when we think of an integrated grid, we are, uh, one of the key elements is the seamless integration of customer resources to help enable a more flexible, uh, more resilient uh, grid. And so that's the uh, pulling together of both local energy optimization as well as uh, uh, global or macro energy optimization. So we see a proliferation, a, a growing uh, adoption of uh, distributed energy resources on the customer side of the meter, uh, whether we speak of uh, photovoltaics, 
for electric vehicles, uh, energy storage, uh, other types of advanced uh, controls, smart thermostats, and so forth. So the question becomes, how can these internet-connected devices, for the most part, be uh, optimized such that they fulfill the functions for which the customer uh, has them for, but can also be intelligently uh, dispatched when needed to provide grid flexibility and other needs. Uh, we see, I think um, most people here would, would recognize and acknowledge the potential uh, for this, uh, as for these custom resources to be a great grid asset. Uh, but how you make that happen is the key. So our uh, theme is how we can get to that point to bridge the technological as well as other uh, uh, gaps to help achieve uh, this shared integrated grid vision. Uh, as I said, we're building on through this weekly webinar series the uh, success of our digital, uh, our digital grid virtual workshop from June 9th through the 11th. Uh, and just as a recap, we had, uh, you know, uh, two great uh, keynote uh, addresses, actually a, a, a third by uh, uh, David Tenenhouse of VMware. Uh, my apologies for that not being there on the screen. Uh, panel sessions, uh, a U.S. utility session, a European session, and a technology session. And speakers representing a diverse array of organizations from uh, utilities in the, in the United States to uh, European entities. Uh, and notable technology companies from around the world. Uh, the presentations and the recordings from those, uh, from those sessions are available uh, at the links below, both on, on the EPRI site as well as on um, the energy.stanford.edu website. So uh, we encourage you, if you have not already, to uh, go to those sites to uh, view the presentations and the recordings. And uh, this session as well will be similarly uh, housed in that same in those same repositories. Uh, just speaking on behalf of uh, you know our two host or host organizations, EPRI, we're an independent nonprofit research organization. Our focus is on uh, R and D for the uh, on all aspects of the electric utility industry for the benefit of of the public, and our uh, mission is really to advance safety reliability efficiency, affordability, and health and environment through our collaborative research. Uh, uh, with regard to uh, Stanford, uh, uh, you know, our Bits and Watts initiative, and, and Leanne can certainly speak on this, but it's a major Stanford initiative focused on digital innovations for the 21st century electric grid. And uh, they advance a number of areas, including business innovation, uh, policies around customer control and end user technologies, and uh, rethinking the relationship between consumers and the electric grid uh, going forward. And our shared goal is, as I mentioned, to convene uh, thought leaders, and we're really excited to have uh, today and through the uh, series planned, uh, really a, a great collection of, of speakers uh, to advance ultimately the development of standardized data platforms to enable uh, grid integration of customer resources. So uh, with that, uh, I just wanted to mention here again that we have, uh, after this week, we have uh, a weekly session. The next two we have uh, confirmed, as you see there, an innovation panel next week moderated by uh, Steve Camello, professor at Stanford University's uh, Graduate School of Business. And the following week, a university panel uh, where we have two uh, outstanding researchers, uh, Amr Free from Dartmouth and Ram Rajagopal from Stanford. Uh, so uh, look for the reminders on that, and as we uh, fill the agenda for the uh, weeks forward, we will uh, keep everyone informed. So uh, reserve this uh, uh, space and, and, and time uh, for, for this webinar series. Uh, let me turn it over now to, uh, to Liang, and uh, can, we can talk about our speakers for today. So uh, Liang, over to you. Thank you, Omar. So uh, today we... Uh, invite the three outstanding moderators who helped us two weeks ago moderate the three sessions, U.S. panel, utility, uh, U.S. utility panel, European utility panel, and the technology company panel. And uh, we decided to invite them back to give a recap what had been discussed, and more importantly, is to add their perspective into this po uh, topic, because we all believe that uh, to achieve the vision of integrated grid and also uh, uh, stand a platform to uh, 
uh, integrate customer DER, we, we need to do it in a collaborative and open way. And uh, so you can see each of them has extensive knowledge and experience in both digital side and also energy or electrical grid side. And each of them, and, uh, besides uh, working on their own company, but also offer a lot of help and in a collaborative way in a different consortiums. So our first moderator uh, who helped moderate the U.S. Uh, utility panel uh, is uh, Rish uh, Gatika. And uh, he is a senior program manager at uh, Electrical Power Research Institute, APRI. And uh, he leads the information and the communication technology for the uh, integration research program at APRI. And uh, before APRI, and the Rich worked at uh, Greenlots as the chief research officer and uh, focusing on the uh, EV integration and the battery technology side. And uh, before Greenlots, Rich worked at uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory and uh, uh, as a deputy uh, leader for the Great Integration Research Program, and also uh, is responsible for as a chief architect for the international uh, data standard for the demand response, which is OpenADR. Our second moderator who helped on the European panel uh, discussion is Marker Chabot, and uh, Marker is the chair and co-chair for the ETIP, which is the European Technology Innovation Platform, SNAT. Smart energy for uh, smart network for energy transition. Uh, the group, one of the group, is called the Digital Energy Group, and he's the chair for that group. And he is also the chair for the uh, ETIP Battery European Group, which is focusing on the battery digitalization and the energy digitalization task force. And uh, he is the senior VP and the senior executive digital officer for GE Digital. And also, he's involved on the business side. He's the chair for the governing board for the RIP, stands for Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency, which is an investment venture capital firm. Our third moderator is uh, responsible for uh, the IT sector, the technology uh, panel on third day, as Nicola Pilmoder. And uh, Nicola is the director for sustainability uh, innovation at VMware. And uh, uh, he collaborated with the VMware different business units, R&D team to improve VMware's product and also the operational efficiency for their customer and also for the company. And uh, before VMware, Nicola worked at uh, Akma Technology and uh, responsible for the renewable procurement uh, for the Akma uh, company and to ensure the environmental sustainability for the company. And uh, she's also the board of directors for the Renewable Energy Buyer Alliance, which a lot of IT companies, energy companies are part of the, uh, this alliance and uh, work together to figure out the strategy that how the company can go toward zero emission. So without further ado, I'd like to hand this to our first speaker and also the moderator for the U.S. Utility Panel, Rich. Thank you, Liang. I really appreciate that. Uh, I guess I can advance the slide now. Right. Uh, so, uh, Orly, are you going to be loading my slides? Your slides are loaded. Just click on the down arrow. Down arrow. Okay. Wonderful. I can see. I uh, hope everybody can see that. Uh, so, uh, the panelists uh, who represented the U.S. utilities, um, I'll quickly go over uh, the U.S. utilities um, uh, who participated in the first panel, uh, focused mostly on uh, four key uh, areas. One, uh, what are the experiences um, uh, with, with respect to this particular uh, area of shared and integrated grid, uh, the digital platform uh, description that Omar just gave a little while ago? Uh, some of the challenges they're facing, uh, where are the opportunities and some of the data requirements, because we are emphasizing the data requirements uh, from, the, uh, from this project's perspective or this area perspective. Um, and all of those looking from the perspective of customer side resources, um, and specifically in uh, understanding and improving their flexibility and reliability, and also um, you know, uh, uh, enhancing the customer experience. So the panelists uh, who participated in this were, uh, you know, uh, three utilities um, uh, that span from all the way from the East Coast uh, uh, to the West Coast. 
Um, uh, John Hughes uh, represented MRN. Um, uh, he's the director of IT and network engineering operations at MRN. Um, you know, John brings in an amazing amount of experience uh, in terms of uh, uh, information technology um, over 33 years. So while he's been working with MRN, uh, he also sits uh, sat on the board, or rather sits still on the advisory board of the um, you know, EPRI uh, ICT program as well. Um, you know, Laura Pierpoint uh, is an amazing, a very dynamic person uh, that has immense knowledge in terms of, uh, you know, uh, focusing on the uh, technology uh, innovation activities for energy within Exelon. Um, she also leads the corporate strategy team um, uh, to really advance the futuristic energy technology trends. Um, so Laura, uh, Laura brought an amazing amount of uh, knowledge and uh, contributions in terms of what actually Exelon is doing uh, in the space. And finally, from the um, uh, west side, uh, Larry Beckerdal, uh, who is the VP for Grid Architecture at Portland General Electric, um, you know, um, showed us a glimpse of what PG&E, uh, PGE is doing, Portland General Electric is doing uh, to build a grid of the future, um, specifically focusing on things that are resilient, smart, um, and also clean energy future, uh, a lot of renewables uh, in the grid. Um, um, you know, uh, similar to John, Larry is also on the advisory committee for EPRI uh, and also the Stanford University Bits and Watch program, which is, uh, you know, co-hosting uh, this particular, uh, you know, uh, series of uh, workshops. So uh, just to summarize, you know, everybody presented almost for uh, 40, 45 minutes. Uh, I'm trying to summarize everything in a, in a, in a few slides. Uh, to be a couple of slides to be precise, um, uh, but I'll also go over quickly uh, some of the slides, some of the key highlights that each of the presenters presented uh, to summarize them. Uh, one of the, uh, you know, areas that we focus a lot is on engaging the customer resources, uh, because that's what we want to emphasize, that's what we want to prioritize. Uh, what, um, you know, if I had to pick four key common challenges all the utilities described in the presentation, these are the four ones that we see here. Uh, we all understand, uh, you, know, um, you know, grid is a very complex system. It's, in fact, a systems of systems. Um, uh, you know, as we go all the way from generation down to the customers who consume the electricity from uh, electricity that's uh, generated, um, it, you know, a lot of information and interactions and, uh, you know, actors have to play a very critical role in delivering uh, that electron down to your home. Um, what's one of the major uh, challenges utilities are facing is their intent to uh, you know, lower the greenhouse gas emission and show environmental uh, stewardship. We have seen in the past that you know, the generation and uh, you know, uh, transportation sectors have been very uh, big um, you know, contributors of greenhouse gas emissions along with the end use uh, sectors. One of the areas that the utilities have, um, you know, taken a big leadership and are trying to figure out how uh, they can get to that, uh, uh, you know, meet that leadership is in the transportation sector. The electrification of transportation is playing a very critical role uh, in some of the challenges utilities are facing. The second one was in the smart technologies. Um, you know, we talk about the smart technologies, whether it's a smart thermostat um, or you know, a smart car or even your smart energy storage system. Uh, is how do utilities take those smartness and, and integrate customer resources that provide benefits to the grid, right? That is a very critical part. The third one is on the communications network. Um, you know, you cannot make the grid smart without having communications in the grid, right? Um, so communications, but not just communications, but reliable communications. Uh, how can you rely on these communication systems so that when you can communicate with the customer resources or even the customers themselves, you can rely on that? And then finally, you know, the new business models or services or market-based approaches play a very critical role. You can have a smart technology, a willing customer, a willing utility. But all of those may not happen unless you create a market around it, which is where the real-time uh, pricing, dynamic pricing, uh, TOU tariff uh, play a very critical role in enabling such uh, customer engagement. And these are how do you enable them are, are some of the challenges. So to look at what MRN, and this is a slide I picked up as a summary slide from MRN, you know, um, they have a very good view of the future. Uh, what they want to achieve, um, you know, 
One thing is for sure, um, you know, uh, what, whether we have seen that with the global changes in the renewable, uh, um, you know, uh, adoption, renewable energy generation adoption, environmental changes they were uh, facing globally, uh, United States is not any different. Um, you know, the bi-directional energy and microgrids are becoming increasingly important. In fact, here, even in California, for example, that is becoming an integral part of some of the uh, state's uh, energy objectives. Um, grid modernization plans are becoming very important for a lot of utilities, uh, thinking about the future, being very strategic, that uses smart technologies, um, but also enabling customers with greater control and value. Uh, because uh, if customers have to engage in this whole um, uh, energy future and, and a smart investment, they have to believe in that and they need to see a value in it. Then also, uh, you know, agility of the utilities. You know, typically a lot of times I have hear uh, I hear that uh, utilities are not innovative. Um, you know, they move very slowly. Um, um, you know, so, uh, the agility becomes very important um, as you start. Uh, in, into this digitizing uh, the electric grid and moving uh, the electric grid um, energy system into a digital uh, grid. Um, so that's why the customer-centric innovation is important. And finally, the electrification of transportation um, that I mentioned earlier. So when you look at what Exelon is trying to do from Lara Pierpoint's perspective, um, she really put a very good, um, you know, uh, relative uh, uh, view of what are some of the emerging infrastructure challenges um, that can be met by the emerging digital solutions. Uh, I won't go through all of those things, but I want to highlight some of the um, you know, uh, areas, especially uh, you know, uh, the areas where machine learning, advanced intelligence, uh, the visualization tools and data, um, you know, et cetera, plays a very critical role uh, in understanding uh, what kind of investments and how those uh, resources from the customer side could be leveraged uh, for providing, uh, you know, uh, value to both the uh, electric utility as well as to the uh, customers. Uh, one highlight that came out of, uh, you know, uh, her presentation was, you know, what one of my role models, uh, Emery Lowen, says, uh, you know, incumbents versus the insurgents, right? Uh, so the insurgents are the new entrants, basically. We have an amazing amount of innovation happening in this industry right now, the startups, private equity, uh, et cetera, are, uh, are aggressively pursuing the digital, uh, you know, solutions market, is how do utilities understand which is the right one and how they can capitalize on it to provide more value uh, is going to be a very important question moving forward. Um, from the Larry Beckett, um, from the distributed resource planning, uh, Larry did a great job in presenting the vision for uh, Portland General Electric, uh, but also looking at from, you know, how can we derive a system value from the electric grid perspective, where you see on the right side, and then customer value on the left side. Um, you know, customer value can be different, the system value can be different, but how do we bring these together in a way um, that, uh, you know, is considering the current grid with, uh, uh, you know, high renewable generation, uh, deployment of uh, energy storage systems, um, you know, uh, batteries, uh, smart technologies, uh, and more engaged customers, et cetera. Uh, so all of those, uh, I think, um, were very well uh, represented uh, by all the uh, utility uh, panelist members, and, and I couldn't be more grateful to have those kind of great minds coming together and describing their uh, vision um, uh, for, uh, you know, uh, uh, grid modernization and digitization. Finally, is now taking those challenges that we presented earlier, how do we translate them into value? Uh, the value to the utilities, to the grid, and value to the customers. are in, uh, Both are equally important. Uh, without uh, one, you really uh, will not have a, a very uh, active engagement or sustainable uh, practices. Uh, one of the area of value is, uh, you know, uh, customer-friendly, sustainable grid modernization roadmap came up very highly. Um, not just thinking about year from now, but thinking three years, four years, five years from now, having strategies that allow you to get to that uh, eventually. Um, the effective automation technologies for customer resource flexibility. Um, you know, when I say there are a lot of automation technologies, but effective ones are the ones that can reliably and persistently provide you with the flexibility um, uh, that considers customers' needs very actively. 
how how can we uh, you know uh, uh, use those uh, to provide value to the customers and to the grid and also processes uh, you know we are getting amazing amount of data into the grid uh, from the grid right now and how do we better manage that data um, uh, network and uh, interoperability among the systems where uh, some of the key value propositions um, that kind of uh, came out and then finally expanded market services and models without um, you know understanding how flexibility power quality or reliability for example and the uh, can be uh, put in a form of a service uh, that the utility can uh, you know engage customers um, and engage uh, you know vendors and technology innovators uh, is going to be a very critical uh, step as well finally i think where we need to go moving forward and and this is where we are going to be emphasizing quite a bit as part of this initiative is, is how do you translate all of those value into strategies that benefit both the customers and grid? What do we need to do uh, to really translate that? How can we work uh, collaboratively together? So with that, that was my last slide, and back to you, Liang. Okay, uh, Risha, this is Omar. Thanks, a great presentation. Omar, yeah. uh, Sorry, uh, yeah. the, quick, quick question for you, and just as a reminder for everyone else, uh, please don't hesitate to uh, go to the chat feature in the bottom if you'd like to ask uh, a question for, for Rish or any of our, our speakers that come. Rish, just one quick question. Uh, one of the earlier slides referenced uh, uh, infrastructure, uh, utility infrastructure planning and then digital solutions. Um, so for capital planning, uh, how can utilities reconcile the longer term time scales of infrastructure investments with the more rapid time scales of digital investments? So that's a good question, um, you know, uh, Omar. One of the things that at least uh, be, I heard from uh, the, uh, the panelists, the utility, is, is, you know, linking the whole area of grid modernization with some business model. You know, grid modernization, whether it includes the aggressive renewables uh, or enabling the, uh, the transmission, making the transmission distribution system smarter, uh, even engaging customer resources with smart loads, et cetera. How do we enable that with with a more uh, you know grid modernization roadmap so that we are more uh, utilities are more strategic and not reactive? I think um, that was one of the very important uh, lesson there. Um, the second one was linking the infrastructure. In past, we have seen the infrastructure developments have been decoupled from the digital investments to a great extent, especially when it comes to leveraging customer resources. Is is start thinking those uh, um, you know infrastructure investments along with digital investment as a collective offering. An example of that would be you know how do you leverage the digital technologies to be able to better manage customer resources, whether it's an electric vehicle or smart load, et cetera. Um, you know uh, specifically from the T and D cost referrals or you know managing more grid more reliably, et cetera. So I think those were uh, two very critical ones. Trying to think, uh, you know, uh, in terms of the utility specifically mentioning, if I could quickly go to Emerin. Emerin mentioned that they have investment of close to $5.3 billion in, um, you know, a grid modernization or uh, between now and 2019 to 2023. That's quite a bit of commitment. You're know, putting dollars where you're, uh, you know, uh, you're talking about. So that was an important one. Uh, but also, uh, you know, if you look at uh, the modernization strategy here that includes smart technologies that I think is a critical link between infrastructure investments and as well as linking them to the smart technologies. But also from the, uh, you know, uh, Exelon perspective, um, you know, Lara was very clear, um, you know, holistic grid and data technology assessments, um, you know, technologies uh, inclusion are very critical from uh, meeting the infrastructure investments like decarbonization goals, right? Um, et cetera. Uh, so how the utility investments, um, you know, uh, uh, can be made to enable such digital technologies uh, to be integrated uh, with the grid. And finally, I mean, uh, Larry, I, I really love the slide that he put together is, you know, deriving the value uh, from both the customer and system value, uh, you know, how, how uh, digital technologies that you see in the middle can provide that value. Um, so they're from the investment perspective, whether it's, uh, you know, reliability investments, operational efficiency investments coming from the utility, and how, uh, you know, you can take those um, investments in terms of uh, digital tech, enabling new digital technologies, 
uh, and, and deploying um, uh, them in the grid that shows value both to the customers and to the system, I think was an important one, yeah. Great, thank you, um, Rish. Why don't we move on to um, our next speaker, um, uh, Mahir Chebo. Uh, so Mahir, it's, uh, the floor is yours. Hi, thank you. So uh, we did have an uh, interesting session with the three uh, panelist speakers uh, from Ireland, from France, and from Sweden. Uh, the first one is uh, Miguel Ponce de Lyon. Uh, he is a technology gateway manager, TSSG. He spoke about a Horizon 2020. When uh, we say Horizon 2020, it's a program from the European Commission to fund research and innovation where there is a need to have different stakeholders, different representatives uh, from different countries coming together and working on innovation projects. So he spoke about a project called SOGNO. Uh, this uh, uh, was like the introduction and uh, giving the uh, foundation and setting up the scene for the uh, rest of the panel. This project, SOGNO, is, uh, a, 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 is part of a, a program of a Horizon 2020, as I said, which is 80 billion of funding available over seven years from 2014 to 2020 and will be followed by another horizon, which is called Horizon Europe, between 2021 and 2027. So SOGNO addresses the topic of next generation innovative technologies, enabling smart grids, storage, and energy system integration with an increasing share of renewables and distribution network. Uh, and he, he, he presented that, he presented the findings actually uh, around the uh, work which uh, took place. The uh, second uh, speaker was Etienne Guéin, and he is uh, from ENGIE, he is Digital Innovation Officer. Etienne uh, spoke about the uh, digital uh, work and digital transformation as a strategy at ENGIE, and uh, what are the challenges and the opportunities uh, they uh, meet into that transformation, and the fact they are moving from uh, central polluting power plants to reduce the carbon-based power plants and replace them by renewables or replace them by gas, which is the least polluting from the hydrocarbon uh, resources. And then the third speaker uh, was from Sweden, Peter uh, Söderström. He is the head of the digital hub at Vattenfall. And uh, he spoke about the whole strategy of uh, Vattenfall in terms of smart meeting first. Uh, Vattenfall, Sweden, was uh, one of the top two countries in Europe who deployed smart metering fully in the countries where they are uh, uh, present and where the regulator has allowed that, like Sweden and Finland. And uh, now they are in the second uh, generation of re-rolling out uh, this smart metering again, having both ways communications and leveraging the latest technologies which were not available 10 years ago when the project took place. So he spoke about that as a step as well to move from uh, a smart metering to the smart grids and what's the role, for example, the smart metering would have into the smart grids and their involvement as well in some European projects like Future Flow and other European uh, projects as well, uh, which uh, interconnects uh, like Future Flow, uh, interconnects different uh, 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 TSOs uh, together and then manage the cross-border uh, between these TSOs. He spoke also about flexicianity, where Vattenfall is actively uh, participating. And this is also a European project where uh, the network companies come and put together uh, some packaged data and services and then uh, allow all the retailers, aggregate, uh, aggregators, and uh, ESCOs to come and have access by being subscribers, have access to this data and uh, to the uh, rest. Now, I will go through the slides uh, uh, a bit to summarize that what they presented fit well with uh, the overall work which is being done in Europe. The digital grid and the customer centricity needs to have a simple one-stop shop, universal and democratized access to energy. And uh, the need for that is 
uh, to have access to all the suppliers that exist in the countries where they are, all the European suppliers, and as well to have a quick activation of any service they would require. So uh, one-stop shop, universal, democratized, simplified and intuitive customer access, all of that is important and leveraging the digitalization in terms of big data, IoT, cloud, data modernization, integration, and the interoperability between systems that were designed not to talk to each other and make them talk to each other, particularly the OT and IT systems, operational technology, which is real time, and IT are systems like enterprise asset management or ERP systems. So the uh, grid operators have a lot of work to be done to make it simpler for the customers to have access to that. So these speakers, the vision and the work that took place on the last year at Europe converged the same thing is we need to make it simple for the customers as it is simple in telecom. And we need to put the customer not at the end, but at the center of the overall value chain. So this picture, if you take the bubble, which is in blue, and you put it outside the planning, you make it very complicated for the customer. And this is why these representatives, most of them from uh, um, TSO or DSO or full uh, integrated utilities, they acknowledged and they uh, spoke about the importance of having a good integration between the networks and the markets. And then bringing that together, that if the customer wants, like in telecom, for example, to access to any supplier or any service, this gets activated immediately. So uh, this is why we speak about like one-stop shop and universal access with uh, both uh, uh, rows, uh, uh, arrows here. Uh, customer wants to have flexibility services. They want even to access not only to customers uh, who are providing services where you need the grid or the access to the grid, but they could also require energy communities access. So energy community could run without a grid. So everything which could be available in the country and all the players that are in Europe, they could access them whether they are living in Paris or they are living somewhere else and so on. And that uh, will facilitate the access to the market, to the openness of the market, uh, that will save also cost in terms of service activation by giving that, doing that integration between the system operators and the markets through uh, this integrated planning open uh, very much the competition as well, because everyone can play everywhere, and then give the customers finally the awareness to play and to participate, uh, rather than uh, looking at the uh, uh, energy as a commodity, and participate and see bundles of services and everything they could access. Like in telecom, they are really participating and they are really spending a lot of time to select the products and services they want. These are all the stakeholders that would be involved from generation to grid. When we speak about generation, we speak about renewables. Of course, the customers, whether they are commercial customers or residential customers. And it's important to involve also the startups because if you build a platform here where customers have uh, a full access to everything, there is a lot of innovations and applications to be developed. And it's whether it's NG or TSSG or Vattenfall or any player, they are all working with startups and innovative companies to come in the game. So, uh, and finally, uh, uh, the, uh, what I heard from the presenters, they fit very well with the, uh, this picture, as uh, there is research and innovation, which is required in the system economics, in the market structure, what are, and the new business models, for example. As I said, to make energy evolve from a conservative behavior to a more advanced behavior like the telecom industry, which was conservative and monopolistic before, to something where the private and the competition played an important role, we need to change the business models, including the aggregators. We need to change the market governance. We need to put also standardization and protocols in place. In telecom, in 12 years, they designed the standard for mobile telephony, for example. We need to have standards. There is a couple of uh, man mandates that SunSelect, Etsy, in cooperation with NIST as well in the U.S. work 
uh, like the M441 for the smart meeting and the M490 for the smart grids. These are important to consider and the importance of data information management, cybersecurity, and the end-to-end -end architecture. Digitalization uh, will uh, look as well into uh, how to put that all together and take these different spare parts and to integrate them, that we could do better planning and better system operations where we need also to involve with the digitalization, the system operations, particularly for the DSO networks that are not as sophisticated, as smart as the TSO networks and to make them self-healing and with more uh, advanced monitoring and control. So I tried with this picture to uh, bring uh, actually the uh, uh, presentations and the point of views of the three speakers into a, a broader European picture here and saying, look, you know, that all converge to that picture where we need the full integration between markets and operations and have the customers at the center of the picture. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. I appreciate it. So, uh, you asked an uh, excellent question in the end of uh, uh, the European Utility Panel, but we didn't have a lot of time to, to discuss that. And also, you touched a little bit today uh, on this slide, and, uh, which is a kind of international collaboration and uh, on the sta standards and also cybersecurity perspective. So, so, the question is, what are the technologies and uh, business practice or business models that are transferable between US and uh, Europe because we have different market structure and uh, uh, different business model. And from your perspective, what is the top three, either technology or business model that are transferable? Yeah, so the, uh, uh, when we, we started and I was one of the co-founders of the Smart Grids Initiative in Europe in 2005, we actually co-invented the name well, that didn't exist before smart grids. We, we had an exchange with US groups like the uh, Gridwise. I remember they invited me to speak about what we are doing in the European smart grids. And we exchanged very much around the a, a reference architecture for the smart grids. This is something which could be transferable. Software companies, Gridwise, I, I think at that time was chaired by IBM, uh, companies like IBM or software companies like SAP and so on, they, if they develop a reference architecture, that could be transferable everywhere. Standardization work, um, you could imagine as well standards for the EV, for the smart metering, like the, uh, based on the mandate M441. As I mentioned, there was a cooperation on the standardization work between the Europeans, sensor like Etsy who were working on that and the different experts around and NIST in the US to also reuse things. And then when you develop cloud-based models, for example, uh, a project like Horizon 2020 Flexicency, it's a kind of an Apple store for applications, bringing together network companies and retailers, ESCOs, and aggregators. So this kind of cloud platform where you could bring these actors together some of them publish data and package services, others have access to that. That could be also transferable. Digital batteries, you know, uh, I'm the, the chair of the task force on digital batteries for Europe, and uh, a lot of the use cases we listed are also transferable. Actually, we speak a lot about Tesla uh, in the work uh, that is being done in this task force. Everything around IoT, for example, or industrial IoT and the models that the data scientists develop related to the assets, I can tell you these solutions work everywhere, whether they are in Indonesia, in Africa, in Algeria, in Europe, or in the US. So it is very important to have a global cooperation that we don't lose time, and we exchange what could be good architectures or standards, and we focus on accelerating the deployment of that everywhere. Thank you, Margaret, really appreciate it. And uh, uh, next one, we have uh, Nicola Piermoda from uh, uh, VMware uh, going to uh, give us her perspective on the uh, technology panels conversation. Nicola, your turn. Thanks, thanks Leon. Uh, good morning and good evening to everybody. Uh, happy to be here to share the insights that we gleaned from our, our uh, technology panel. 
So the, the things that we covered, uh, that panelists covered, is, is really the macro trends that we're seeing in the energy industry and, and also the buying side, the challenges uh, that, that the industry is facing, and then finally, the evolving and enabling digital technologies, the innovation that's happening there. The panelists, uh, we had the keynote speakers from Arun and David Tenenhaus, which I'll, I'll try to weave into, into this overview. And then our panelists were O.P. Ravi from Microsoft. He's a principal program manager, principal Kadria. He's a global power sector uh, for solutions design in Internet of Things. And finally, Rayford Smith, uh, of Google Data Center Energy uh, and Solutions Strategy. Uh, so very, very interesting conversations, and I'll, I'll weave in uh, what their comments were. So first, let's let's cover the macro trends that, and challenges that that the industry is seeing. So the first one is clearly that renewables are here to stay. And Arun took us on a little bit of a, a, histor uh, a nostalgic memory tour of, um, and he discussed that uh, in 2010, the Department of Energy uh, had a moonshot program that had an aspirational goal of reducing the cost of solar to five cents a kilowatt hour without subsidies. And I think at the time they thought this was, you know, just a VHAG goal. Um, but, of course, renewables are now uh, some of the cheapest ways to generate electricity, uh, which is upending the uh, utility industry in many ways. Then, uh, and then, of course, um, the least of, uh, of which is that renewables is a variable supply. And so, and now, of course, just distributed supplies are both bringing instability to the grid. Uh, they're both very um, welcome. Um, um, welcome uh, improvements to the grid, but, but they're bringing instability. So in addition to the instability, we have the rise of energy aware devices, the need for more resiliency in the face of storms and fires. As Rich was saying, uh, decarbonization requirements, economic supply, and that this, so this now really requires digital communications, controllable demand, edge computing, real-time analytics, uh, and of course, not, not least, end-to-end -end security uh, cybersecurity layers. All right. The second trend is is the demand shift from oil to electricity. And again, Arun uh, noted that with the rise in global demand for electric vehicles and the move to replace natural gas and heating with electricity, uh, there's a beginning of a massive shift from oil and gas to electricity. And both of these are both uh, both are a challenge and an opportunity. Uh, to the utility industry. He also pointed out that the rise in electric vehicles is, is really forcing an unforeseen and necessary collaboration between mobility industry, electricity, and IT sectors. And I think we're going we're gonna to see more and more of this across various industries like manufacturing and even cities. You know, you hear the rise of smart cities and smart manufacturing um, enabled by AI machine learning, IoT technologies. The third trend is really the corporate demand for renewable energies and its acceleration. So since about uh, 2010, uh, there's been a growing buying spree of renewable energy by corporations in an attempt to decarbonize their operations, which is increasingly demanded uh, by their customers, investors, and employees. And since about 2015, at least in the U.S., corporations have outpaced utilities in renewable energy procurement, which is, I think, something that nobody really first saw uh, even, even 10 years ago. Uh, so let's, let's look at a couple examples of this. Is, um, if you've not heard of RE100, if you go to RE100.org, this is an organization that is getting companies to uh, sign up for 100% renewable energy goals of their operations. And generally, this is their own internal operations. And to date, there's been 241 companies uh, that have made this commitment. Another example is Science-Based Targets, which is an organization that is getting companies to commit to reducing their absolute carbon emissions in alignment with the Paris Climate Accord to reduce carbon emissions to zero by 2050. And what's interesting about the Science-Based Targets is that it's not only in a co company's own operations, but it's also in their supply chain, which is something, this is a very new development we've seen. And it is really ri uh, raising the bar for renewable energy procurement because that is one of the 
obvious ways for companies to reduce their energy consumption. Uh, and you may think this may not be that interesting, but uh, now there are over 900 companies signed up, and I think there's probably five to 10 signing up um, every, every month. Uh, this, this was about 400 companies back in the beginning of 2019. Uh, and just to give you some idea, this is a subset, of, a significant subset of those 900 companies. Just to give you an idea that these are very large global marquee companies, they're cross-sector. So this is not just a, a Silicon Valley high-tech trend that we're talking about here. And Rayford talked a little bit about what Google's doing, and I'll cover that uh, later. Now let's talk about the, uh, so, so we have this challenge, uh, so we'd like to talk about um, the, the, the need for the te technology solutions and really what, what's happening. Uh, so we got a, a taste of that from Principal uh, Rayford and um, NOP. Seeing, uh, seeing this opportunity, the IT sector is, is rising to the challenge. Uh, so key areas of, of innovation include infrastructure modernization, that's obviously a very, very broad topic. Uh, support for automated, dynamic, distributed energy resources, obviously distributed uh, resource services, and demand management. And then, of course, needing to layer across that is end-to-end -end and intrinsic cybersecurity, which is a very big topic. Uh, and finally, the glue that, that holds all this together, these technologies, and brings them all together and enables them, which is IoT, as we know, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, to support the data analytics moder uh, monitoring and insight uh, and, and actions that, that are required um, in, a, in a digitized system. And finally, uh, while, while it wasn't in the main presentation, there was certainly discussion afterwards about the general recognition of the need for government regulatory policy uh, and incentives to support and accelerate the transition to a modernized and decarbonized grid. <laughs> My voice is a little froggy today. <laughs> um, so, Prispo uh, discussed innovations happening at the edge to assist with optimization of integration of renewable energy and DERs, including uh, analytics and security uh, for, for feeder optimization. And this is quite an interesting slide, so I'll just pause for a moment so you can, hopefully you can see some of the details. But it did include uh, the use of distributed batteries uh, to, to be able to help with um, voltage and frequency management. Um, at the edge um, and the impact of the variable supply of DERs as well. Uh, so another, another thing he pointed out was he provided insights into the modernized utility data center, uh, so representing substation automation in this case, providing extensive control and monitoring for all of the required functionality and services that are needed um, at the edge. And of course, the, uh, the Intels of the world, the Hitachis, the VMwares, are all in the process of developing the technology and certifications that are required by the utility industry. Then moving on, uh, regarding demand management, uh, there's a lot going on in the area of, of course, EV charging control and, and also data center load optimization. OP discussed some of the exciting work in the area of utility EV charging management, including a, a joint venture between Microsoft Azure and Alago to develop a platform with capabilities that enable grid operators and energy suppliers to adapt to the energy demand on the grid that is represented by uh, electric vehicles um, and the growing challenge that represents. Then Rayford uh, focused on innovations going on in the world of data center load management. So a recent study out of, uh, led by um, uh, Eric um, Manassan over in uh, UC Santa Barbara estimated that data center electricity consumption is at about 1% of global energy supply or electricity supply. However, on the good, good news side is while demand for commuting has increased more than five and a half times from about 2010 to 2018, energy consumption has only increased 6%. So these amazing efficiency and productivity gains really have relied heavily on hardware efficiencies um, at the server layer in the form of, you've probably heard of Moore's Law, Denard scaling, and virtualization. So we will need to look elsewhere for future efficiencies uh, if we're to offset the inevitable and massive increases in computing demand that will be accelerated by the likes of AI, machine learning, IoT, and edge computing. 
but there's innovation happening uh, in many areas, including uh, elimination of, of the massive amount of waste in IT infrastructure and freeing up stranded assets. Uh, some more interesting work is being done in shifting data center demands, both temporally and geographically, uh, to when and where electricity supply is plentiful, cheap, and, and low carbon. And finally, uh, having a temporal matching of renewable energy supply and data center load. So temporal matching of both RE supply and load is a new trend. It's sort of the high bar set by corporations now in renewable energy procurement that's being led by Google. And so we do expect this to be a significant trend over the next five to 10 years among corporate renewable energy buyers. And then uh, Rayford um, was, was sharing the work that Google's doing on the ladder, which is the temporal matching between renewable energy supply and uh, data center demand. So this graphic shows the delta between the annual renewable energy supply of a, a wind project they have done in Chile um, and the data center load um, over that same time period. So with the, uh, with the addition of uh, the additional wind and solar procurements that Google um, is doing in, in Chile, they determined that it will be able to achieve 100% match or close to 100% match between the renewable energy supply and data center demand uh, with those project uh, procurements. And then finally, as I mentioned earlier, the utility, IT, and academic sectors need to come together with a unified voice to support and incentivize and accelerate the transition to a modernized and de decarbonized grid. So that, that's a summary of, of what we covered in our, in our amazing tech panel. Thank you, Nicola. So I, I really feel that uh, we, we is a buy one, get one free. So when, when we designed this uh, conversation and uh, it was really focused on the customer DI, uh, uh, integration, then we invited all the technology panel is we expect them to talk about uh, uh, the great technology like uh, we heard, IoT and uh, uh, machine learning, edge computing, cloud computing, et cetera. But we also learned a very interesting perspective is uh, uh, the data center with, and also the renewable procurement because uh, uh, you guys, the IT company, also are a customer DER. You, know, you have a huge DER deployed. How we can help you guys better integrate into the into the grid is something we can think about in the future. So we, I have another question is, uh, uh, you know, we talk about different uh, future connectivity of customer DER. We heard cloud computing, which is more like centralized all the information together. Another is the edge computing, which is more like distributed architecture. So what are the potential cyber risks to this two different type of architecture or technology? Do we have like a one-stop shop, like a marker mentioned cybersecurity solution for both architecture? So uh, unfortunately, no, um, but the good news is, is that's a very well-recognized problem. And of course, corporations, anybody who's using the internet today, using edge, using cloud, on-prem, recognizes the, the, the problem. And, and the idea is right now it's a very fragmented security market, security solutions uh, all over the place, and it's, uh, it's all bolted on. But there is a trend towards what's called intrinsic security and where it's building in security at, at the hardware layers, the connectivity layers, and then also the application layers so that you it's not an afterthought. It, it's really seamless whether you're connecting between on-premise machines or from an on-premise machine into the cloud or from a transformer station uh, to, to a, a distribution station. Um, and, and so while we're not there yet, I think the utility industry needs to continue to, to demand uh, very high vigilance around cybersecurity for its, its, uh, its, this new technology. Um, and that will drive, drive um, attention to this uh, within the IT industry. Perfect. Thank you, Nicola. So, uh, thank you, all of you. Then, with that, I will hand this to Oma. Then, let's get started with the uh, Q&A and the moderated conversation with all the three uh, panelists today. Oma? 
Great, thank you. And I do have a little bit of background noise that I can't escape, so hopefully it's not too disruptive. So great, fantastic presentations. We have one question that came in from the, uh, from the chat that I'll just uh, read and it's uh, open uh, for any of the, uh, our speakers. Uh, could you share your thoughts about the plug and play model in the power distribution sector? Uh, could we swap out old devices and plug in new ones without affecting the grid? So general question, but in the context of our discussion here, any, uh, any thoughts on that question? Yeah, the, uh, if I may, yeah. Maher, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, the, the uh, requirements, for example, on uh, the smart metering connected to the grid, every tender that went out in uh, Europe, 28 states that are part of Europe, required to have an interchangeability between the uh, meters. So if you unplug, for example, a meter from Landis and Gear and you put another one from Itron, it should continue to work. So that was part of the requirements to have this plug and play model, if you wish, uh, on uh, some of these devices. This is one example, but there are also other examples of interchangeability, for example, between the, the devices. Any other thoughts on that, uh, Rish or Nicola? Hilmar, if I may. Um, uh, in my perspective, I think, uh, at least hearing the panelists speak from the U.S. utility, the answer depends, right? Uh, when we say swap out old devices and plug in new ones without affecting the grid, it depends on the type of device and who is plugging it in. Um, an example would be an electric vehicle, right? Um, uh, we may consider it as a device, a charging a unit, uh, a charging unit, a level two charging unit is anywhere from 6.6 .6 kilowatt to 7.2 kilowatts. And if you look at the average energy use in a residential building around two kilowatts a peak, uh, you know, you're more than doubling or tripling that load. Uh, and if you don't have enough transformer capacity and if your neighbors start doing that, it's a very different problem than saying, okay, I just bought uh, a phone and I'm plugging in a new device, a new phone uh, at my home. So it all depends on what kind of device that is and who is plugging it in and where within the grid system um, you reside. So that becomes, but that's still a very important question. You know, you may not have a problem right now with one device, but collectively when you aggregate these devices, it may become a problem. In fact, we're seeing it has become a problem, um, you know, whether at the transmission level, at the uh, feeder level, at the substation level, et cetera. Um, so one of the things we are trying to do here, uh, at least, uh, you know, that even uh, John Hughes from Emerin uh, uh, is, is looking into building a network uh, that allows um, the whoever is plugging in those devices to be able to communicate with the grid uh, to really understand the impacts of it, whether it's energy storage systems or distributed generation, et cetera. Um, and we are also working here in California on some interconnection rules. Uh, for example, the Rule 21 in California is an important one that enables more, um, I would say, uh, safe and uh, reliable connection of devices within the grid that in a way that doesn't impact the electric grid, but also enables utilities to manage that device if it is causing any good impact with all uh, full engagement of the customers. So I think it all depends on that. The interoperability, I think Meher mentioned interoperability. Um, in the, there was also a very uh, big highlight of uh, one of some of the presentations that uh, utility panelists did. Uh, even here at EPRI, we take that very seriously, the standards interoperability, along with the uh, you know, uh, rest of the things uh, that are covered. Um, so I would say uh, absolutely, answer all depends, but it's an important problem to start thinking about here. Okay. Uh, just, just following up on that point, uh, on, on the topic of interoperability, this is a qu question for, for all, the, uh, all of our uh, speakers here. Uh, you know, when we speak of, uh, you know, integration of customer resources, that, uh, we're talking about a tremendous, um, you know, interchange of data between a number of, of entities, uh, you know, customers, utilities, uh, technology providers, third party uh, providers, and so on. So how do we get to a level of standardization in terms of the data formats or other specifications of how the data is, is packaged and uh, across platforms? Um, are the existing standards bodies and committees that are in place sufficient for the type of integration that we're seeking here, or is there a need for uh, some uh, additional effort, perhaps some new committee or working group 
specifically around this theme. So any thoughts on that around sort of data platforms and interoperability? It's, uh, it's very complicated. I, I, I don't think we are still uh, there. They have been a lot of work on the standardization, as I mentioned, some and dates on which a lot of experts work. Uh, I mean, in Europe, there is a, a standardization body, which is called SEN, which makes standardization in uh, different sectors. And Senelec is part of SEN, and they work on standardization for the electricity. And then when it comes and involves data transfer and IT, uh, most of the time, Etsy, which is another organization for telecom <coughs> and IT, comes and work together with Senelec, for example, on this. And you can't imagine the number of experts who were involved in first defining what could be the minimum requirements, for example, uh, for, uh, let's take the example of smart metering, the 10 functionalities to say, yeah, these are the minimum requirements for smart metering. And then before uh, that, a lot of experts come together to say, these are the minimum requirements for smart metering. And then after that, there is a mandate which is issued and there is a request from Sentinel like Etsy to work, for example, on the standardization. But uh, I'm not sure we still have today something like air France ar architecture where it just, you know, you buy it, it's already pre-configured, pre-developed, and so on, and then you implement it if you want to move, for example, your old system to a new smart grid system. There's a lot of interfaces. I remember one of the working groups and the in the smartest was looking at the interfaces. We did count like 160 critical interfaces where the data uh, goes back and forth and so on across the value chain. And uh, uh, of course, you have problems security, privacy as well. Uh, and uh, even if you you look at the, all the work that the IEC have been doing and so on, I'm not sure it's that simple. I'm not sure it's that complete today. There have been a lot of work but we are still not there to make it simple everywhere. There are also projects. If you look at the EV charging, uh, there was a big European funded project with 42 members called Green Emotion involving cities, car manufacturers, utilities, and so on. to define a kind of a, a standard for the electrical vehicles and EV charging across Europe. Uh, that project uh, has been executed a few years ago are we still there? Not yet, because you know these are all new uh, new sectors, new dom domains of expertise, and there's also a lot of competition. So there were people also and voices saying, if you standardize something, you kill the competition. And this is misunderstanding. You could boost the competition if you standardize it at the right level of the data exchange, but they still leave a space, for example, for the development of of, of services properly. Any other thoughts on that? And then just to add to it, and uh, another question that came in related around the the kind of the custody of the data. You know, who 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 owns that? And uh, you know, is it if it, we're talking about customer device data, is there sort of an agreement? I would think it's more um, there are more kind of stringent rules in place in Europe, as I understand, Mahir, about uh, customer uh, ownership of their device data and the privacy uh, associated yeah. with that. But just on the theme of interoperability and, 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 and data custody. Uh, it, was, it was said very clearly that customer's data is owned by customers. Every time you need to share this data and so on, customers should, could, should give them approval for that. When it comes to uh, asset data, for example, Siemens or ABB or GE providing equipments, asset equipments to utilities like Duke Energy, PSENG or Enel and so on, they, these customers who have turbines, wind turbines or networks, they own the data that comes from uh, these assets. And if they want, let's say on the digital side, to uh, uh, gather the data from uh, a Siemens equipment and work with another software or other hardware uh, uh, play, they could. They own this data because they paid for it and they asked for the equipment to be installed there, right? As long as they don't infringe somewhere the uh, security of the equipment provided by one vendor, in principle, they own the data and they could work 
they should not be trapped actually into one vendor, right? So if an equipment provider has installed the, uh, uh, the equipment somewhere at one of the utilities, the utility has absolutely the right when it comes to the data and the digitalization to work with anyone. Good. So, Omar, we have a, a couple questions coming from the chat. So, uh, again, a reminder for audience, uh, you know, I would encourage you to type your questions through the chat, and uh, Omar and I will monitor this carefully, and we try to combine some of the questions together. So, we have a very interesting question coming from the audience regarding non-OCED country, uh, like India and uh, uh, some of the uh, Southeast Asia. So, we talk a lot about the U.S., the European, and how great our, our technology are. So the question is, what are your view on enabling digital tech for clean energy access in rural area of the world? And I would broaden this a little bit. You know, what's your view of enabling digital technology and the business model to help clean energy access in the rural area in non-OCED countries? Okay. So I would take it. <clears throat> I, I spoke a lot about the Europe and the European Commission with my role. Uh, as a co-chair uh, and, and, and chair on the digital batteries and digital energy transition. But I have also another role being the chair of the governing board of uh, REAP, uh, Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Partnership, which is focusing on low and mid-income countries in the world, typically in Africa. Uh, REAP is <coughs> in charge of executing on a project of a 60 million funded by the Swedish foreign ministry which has the objective to give energy access in mini grid, off grid, to 5 million people in sub Saharan Africa, in Zambia, Liberia, Mozambique, and Burkina Faso. And so far, there are about 1 million people who have access to energy. So there was a platform developed called Edison, uh, which you could access on the internet, anyone could access to that, uh, called uh, uh, beyond the grid, uh, BGFZ, beyond the grid for Zambia, bgfz.edison.org, something like that. Uh, and then you could see the dashboard in real time of how many new connections have been established. When it's a new connection, it's like a house who got like a couple of solar panels and a battery that they could uh, uh, charge uh, their mobile phone, the radio, and light uh, two rooms. And there is about 150,000 connections equivalent to. Uh, 850,000 people, close to 1 million, as I said, in Zambia, who got that already. Uh, and uh, there is now a rollout going in the other uh, sub-Saharan Africa countries. So Edison collects the data from the new uh, customers being uh, uh, connected uh, and then follows the KPIs about, you know, who was exactly the customer or the, the gender side. Was it like 26% of women, for example, requested? Uh, what's the carbon uh, reduction because it's coming from uh, renewables, uh, how many schools are equipped, how many uh, uh, additional investment came in the game together with the de-risking uh, investment uh, coming from the Swedish uh, foreign ministry and so on. So it's very sophisticated. It's all accessible on the web when you type beyond the grid for Zambia or beyond the grid for Africa, BGFZ or BGFA uh, or REAP, for example, and you will find a lot of information about that. Perfect. Uh, Ray, Shaw, Nicola, uh, I'm not sure if you want to add, add something here. Yeah, I can add a little bit, Liang. Uh, in my engagement, you know, um, uh, with uh, some of the uh, non-OCD countries like India, for example, uh, is an important one. Um, I was involved in uh, two former secretaries' efforts to bridge some of the technology and knowledge transfer with India. Uh, you know, uh, Dr. Stephen Chu, whom I admire immensely, uh, also from Stanford, uh, and, and Ernie Muniz, who is the now in the Energy Futures Initiative, uh, you know, uh, it was very actively engaged in international uh, cooperation as part of this initiatives to really um, address uh, the decarbonization issues, energy access issues, et cetera, with the, um, you know, uh, with the, with the uh, what we call as emerging uh, economies. Uh, in the world. Uh, in one of the things I've learned in India, you know, uh, close to two thirds of India is still in rural. Um, you know, $340 million of the close to the population in the United States didn't have energy access. So the initiatives like energy access and 24 7 power for all 
where some of the key drivers to just provide energy access um, uh, to the to these rural uh, uh, you know uh, uh, citizens. But one of the things is also to better to understand is how do you provide the energy? You know, the, deriving a transmission distribution infrastructure and drive, it, uh, is a very costly affair and may not work out. Is is what we call as uh, you know a microgrid. Um, you know, microgrids have existed in United States and Western countries for a long time. But microgrids are based on renewables is an important one. Um, even even in India, we have microgrids in every home uh, powered by diesel generators. A lot of offices, because of lack of reliability, they have diesel generator microgrids, right? But driving those microgrids in a way that allow a more resilient and self-sustained community, whether it's one rural area or a village, or see the other. Uh, and then second thing was in, uh, innovation in the cost and business model and services. How do you incentivize people? Because you know vendors may not be willing uh, to sell technologies when there is not too much of uh, you know profit uh, coming out of it. But how do you make this uh, into a very innovative uh, business policy? The bankability aspects of it were all very critical components. Uh, some of the things that we looked, at, you know, uh, other than DOE, um, even U.S. aid, for example, there's a tremendous amount of work um, in advancing some of the uh, international developments in this phase. Um, you know, but I would say uh, the technology uh, knowledge transfer activities are very critical. Um, you know, one thing at least I've learned from my father, who was a teacher, is you know, learn from other people's mistakes. Um, you know, life is too short to make your own mistakes. Is the same example. We have done it. We have seen it. How the um, you know uh, emerging economies can learn and implement it in a sustainable way it, it becomes an important one. And second, becomes a cost. Um, and how do you make it cost effective? Uh, because the countries may not be uh, in a position to spend the same amount of money. Making it very cost effective and affordable. Because it's a very critical aspect. Yeah. Terrific. Omar, any question from your end? Or oh, Nikolai, anything you want to add before we jump to the next question? No, I'm good, thanks. Okay. Yeah, just, just yeah. to add on, so, there, uh, there is on, the, on what we, uh, we have seen with the panelists and so on, uh, and what, what I just heard, I mean, the, the evolution between like giving energy access, for example, from renewables, batteries, and so on, then connecting them into a microgrid or mini grid, and then connecting them to the smart meters and connecting them to the grid. So there is like a maturity model between if you're giving access to energy to someone and how you, you can connect that to the rest of the, of the grid. And it's very interesting to look into that uh, and, and moving from uh, the uh, low and income uh, priorities to something uh, that are uh, in more in the developed countries, for example, uh, you know, how to make the grid uh, smarter and how the grid can connect a big number of, uh, of, of microgrids or mini grids. In Africa, there is about 10,000 10, mini grids potential projects. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so uh, I have a question. And again, it, uh, as Liang said, please, if um, you all who are uh, listening in, uh, please don't hesitate to uh, type in your questions in the chat feature and we will uh, read it for our, uh, our speakers to address. Um, I have a question just on, you know, uh, the point's been made by, by several of you about the importance of the customer, keeping the customer uh, at the forefront, uh, Mahir, as, as you pointed out. But um, how do we, you know, with all the potential of these technologies on the customer side of the meter to provide some value in terms of flexibility and serving other grid, grid needs. How do we align customer um, uh, interests uh, with, with the utilities for, 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 for grid flexibility? So, you know, in other words, you know, are things like time dependent pricing mechanisms enough? Um, if not, how else can utilities engage with customers to not only incentivize the adoption of, you know, things like solar and electric vehicles, storage, um, advanced controls, but also their use and the ability to, for them to be, or to allow their dispatch to fulfill grid, grid flexibility needs. So what can be, what's in it for the customer or can be made uh, appealing to the customer in this respect? Uh, open for all, maybe uh, Nicola, maybe starting with you and then uh, going through all of our speakers. Yeah, well, I think uh, historically, you know, users of electricity have been seen as rate payers, not customers. 
and that's very different from so the, the, the private sector. But I think the idea is, is just what value can be provided. And so companies are looking for resiliency, economy, efficiency, um, decarbonization. So I think to the extent that utilities can see that as a value added services that they can provide that do have value to the customers and they're willing to pay for that, um, I think it's a, just a, a a new way to look at um, how they, it's not just about delivering electrons anymore. Okay. okay. Maher, Rish? Yes. I think those um, are, uh, go ahead. Go, I think Maher first are, and then Rish. Yeah, if you are in a, a non-competitive market, you would say that when uh, uh, the commerce side of a utility or the retail side of the utility is putting in place programs to reduce consumption, you would say this would contribute to less revenues for them, unless uh, they are really stuck and during the peak demand, uh, they have no other option because there's not enough capacity than really putting in, pro in place programs like California, for example, has put that into uh, shifting uh, the, uh, the load and uh, asking people to consume when there is uh, off peak. But in competitive markets, if you think that way, uh, you will be out of business because others will do it. So there is competition. And you need to provide to the customers the classical way, consume, bill, and brings you a lot of revenues as a retailer. And at the same time, giving the, the opportunity to consume less, to consume differently, to consume clean, and so on. Even if this is sometimes reducing your revenues, but in the but you have to think about diversifying your as a retail. You have to rethink your business model, and you have to think there are other competitors. If you don't do it, they would do it. And this is a game, and all the retailers, for example, in Europe, where the market is open since 1st of July 2007, has absolutely understood it. Okay, great. Rish, any thoughts you'd like to add? Yeah, I think a couple of things, I think, from that perspective, Omar, it's a very good question. Um, I would say at two levels. Uh, one is, we need to start thinking beyond TOU. Um, you know, uh, for a long time, a majority of customers in the United States had flat rates, right, like residential. We had a TOU and more dynamic uh, rates, uh, depending on utility for large commercial industrial customers. But for residential, it had been major, uh, uh, majorly flat rates. Uh, but that is changing slowly. For example, you know, uh, just a year and a half ago, we, California translated into uh, uh, TOU rates. For residential customers, right? And that was a very important move uh, in in uh, engaging customers to uh, flexibly manage their loads. Uh, if I have an option uh, to charge my electric car, uh, not as soon as I come home at 6 p.m. or 7 p.m. from work, but charge at 11 p.m. because my car would be still charged when I wake up in the morning and be able to drive back to work. I would be happy to do that if it is an incentive for me to do it, and it also helps the grid uh, as well as uh, uh, me. The, and the second thing I think is important to is is where I said go beyond TVU is moving into more dynamic pricing. Um, you know, the whole area of demand response is uh, requires so much of customer engagement um, and, and assessment of uh, policies. That is, you know, the, making it more revenue neutral for electric utilities. So why would they ask customers to lower their electricity use when their business model is built on more selling more electricity? Uh, it's a fundamental question so that need to be answered. So making that revenue neutral, uh, uh, you know, through rate-based program has been uh, one of the key ways the demand response program has been able to create tariffs uh, to engage customers. But if you move more towards more dynamic rates uh, and even more renewables in the grid and, and GHG emissions, et cetera, embedding them in the whole, uh, you know, uh, 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 dynamic uh, pricing rates and, and, and encouraging um, at the second level uh, is uh, embracing innovation uh, and technology. Uh, I think that is also very critical where vendors are now developing optimization models and technologies that, you know, we never had these uh, NAS or communicating uh, charging infrastructure, et cetera, uh, even four or five years ago, they're like we have what we have right now uh, adopted at scale. Um, so I would say those two will play a very important role in how well can you create dynamic pricing uh, policies uh, and embrace those uh, dynamic pricing policies through market mechanism, and second is technology uh, innovation. Yeah. Great, thank you. Liang, I'll um, back over to you. Great. 
Uh, we have about six minutes left. So uh, we have a very interesting question here. I'm going to combine uh, this question with uh, some of my personal uh, interests here. So the question is, uh, uh, for the, compared to the IT sector, the utility industry is kind of a little bit lag, is kind of lagging industry. And because the technology is moving very fast on the IT sectors. And uh, uh, when we talk about the standardization, you know, how the standardization process in the utility sector when we do the digital transformation can keep the same pace as, uh, as the IT sector. The quick, quick example is, uh, you know, my car, the Tesla car, has always has a, a software update almost every month or two. And uh, the phone we have, if we want to control the Nest or whatever, is uh, keep updating the iOS on the Android platform every, every several weeks. Right. And if we look at the history, uh, a great example is a, is a smart meter, is AMI. We still use the WebMax as one of the key uh, uh, communication uh, to translate the, the data you know, between the, um, the router to the hub. And uh, we've we heard a lot of great technology and how we can keep the pace and how the IT technology can involve the business, not just the technology transition, but also the business model transition on the utility sector. Yeah, this is a, a comment or a question? It's a hybrid. It's a hybrid question. Hybrid. The one is standardization, how do we keep the pace? And the second one is more like how the IT, the great technology can involve the business model transition for the utility sector. Yeah, I, mean, <clears throat> I look, uh, so first of all, the first competitor to software companies or digital industrial providers are the utilities themselves because they understood that data is very important. They need to keep control. Not only control, this is also a high margin compared to the, uh, to the hardware business. So they have uh, set up teams, uh, budgets. A company like Enel, which is probably the, uh, one of the top two largest utilities uh, in the world, 70 million customers, uh, they have a budget of uh, more than five billion for digitalization. Eighty-three percent of that budget is being spent on the distribution networks. They understood that. They uh, they have put in place teams like in Tel Aviv with innovation and funneling and working with startups and so on. They develop digital twins themselves. They have projects in Brazil and everywhere in the world. But on top of that, they have also the structure to be to have, for example, for distribution networks, the full responsibility worldwide where they could put digitalization across uh, this whole business. So they understood it. Now, of course, you need distributors to come together and transmission companies to come together. In Europe, INSOE, the Association of Transmission, has a collaborative program among the 40 TSU members to build a digital platform where you could uh, plug things uh, through APIs and so on on the digital platform uh, in, a, in a consistent and standard way for, for everyone. Uh, and uh, uh, to the other thing, like the example of Tesla and operating system, still uh, we are not there, but of course we are talking about having a kind of an operating system for energy, very easy for customers and so on. Uh, at least at the European side, and we take the example of Tesla on batteries, we speak about the same thing and so on. This is because, I mean, on Tesla, Elon Musk had a great vision and he understood that a car could be like an iPhone and they could have great things and provide things without changing your car. Uh, and, and that's, for me, it's a good vision as well to think about it for the energy sector. Rich, Nicola, anything? Uh, just a quick comment. I think, uh, you know, uh, considering the time, uh, in 30 seconds, I think utilities are embracing digital transformation. Um, you know, we have seen that in the presentations that all the U.S. panelists uh, made. An example is investment in the private LTE network, uh, investment in participating in standards organizations. But it will take time. Uh, the IT industry is pretty fast in the nimble industry. 
utility is uh, has a lot of regulations, a uh, diverse set of players. Uh, so it's not as easy as to change as an IT industry might have, but we are seeing that trend. Uh, I think that is an important and encouraging aspect of it. Uh, the utilities are very active in the standards work. Um, you know, we have seen, uh, at least here at EPRI, you know, utility sits on most of the standards development organization's effort, with for energy storage systems, electric vehicles, demand response, right? Etc. So they're very actively participating, embracing those because they have started to realize enabling cost-effective co integration of the distributed resources and leveraging them to provide uh, new uh, services to utility will play a very critical role. Uh, but so if I have to put standardization, you know, at three levels, going back to the other questions previously, you know, Ernie Muniz said the famous innovation cycle, you know, uh, invention, translation, adoption, and diffusion. Adoption is early stage, uh, and diffusion is a, uh, is a, you know, a market scale. Uh, you know, the, the standards are at each of these three levels. Uh, we have to constantly innovate and invent new areas that we need, but there are standards that are ready to be adopted. You know, things like what we are doing at Rule 21 for smart inverters, you know, to base distributed energy resources, for example. But there are uh, standards that are ready for adoption, like things for automated demand response, you know, the IEC standards that are there in the grid, uh, I 61968, um, the common information model, et cetera, are very important aspects that you can take and adopt. So I would say, yes, uh, it's been an uphill climb, and I know for a good reason, because the climb is uphill, uh, uh, but at the same time, uh, utilities are embracing digital technologies. Great, we, we are right here at the end, and um, unfortunately, I know we, we could probably go on, but uh, uh, with respect for everyone's time, we should uh, uh, conclude here. So. Uh, uh, Liang, let me, on behalf of, of, of Stanford and EPRI, thank uh, Nicola, Mahir, and Rish. Uh, uh, outstanding presentations, great conversation. Thank you all for attending and for your questions. Uh, please tune in next week for the uh, second in our uh, weekly webinar series. Um, have a great rest of the, uh, the week, and uh, we look forward to talking to you again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. I appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for joining. Bye. Bye. Bye.